what's going on. You need matrices that are like at least by eight by eight, and and I don't know if I want to put that up here. Um, let's see. Um, and the MMDS book does not do this part of the class very very well, though it does have an example. Um, so. So, so I, I think actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up the up the algorithm, which is actually very simple, and then maybe we'll come back and talk about it and see if it makes more sense. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to think of choosing each of these columns to put in this 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 matrix here, saying which of these attributes are most most important, and. The, the, the way we think of which one is the most important is going to be we're going to look at this uh, this column, which is a vector, and look at its norm and square it. So, so pj is going to correspond to a weight, uh, this weight wj, which is the two norm of pj squared. Right? So, so this is going to be equal to the sum over i equals 1 n of pij squared. So now we're going to take all the elements in here, square them, and add them up. And this is going to be the weight. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to choose t of these columns proportional to their weight. So um, set T like this is going to be this representation. So you, like, <coughs> this is maybe a little bit unintuitive at first. Why would you sample them this way? Why don't you just, so the, the, the ones that, the dimensions that describe the most variation are going to be the ones that essentially have the largest value. You should think of this data as being centered around zero. If you don't do that, then you essentially lose one dimension. But, but think of the data as being centered, so the, the average of all dimensions is zero. And then the ones that have the largest two norm are the ones that, on average, the points are the furthest away. That's basically what this is saying. Along, if you looked at all the points along this dimension, they're on average this far away. Okay, and so you're gonna choose them proportional to this. Now, an alternative, our first thought might be, just to choose the dimensions which, um, which are the which have the largest mass, and choose these. But if you do this, then it's it's um, it's uh, um, you're going to get some which are repetitive, are telling you um, the same information. Um, whereas if you choose these, this is kind of like the k-means plus plus algorithm, where you chose some proportional to how how far away they are. And you tend to choose ones that are describing these different dimensions. That data is very important. So, and if, if you do this, then you're going to get the, the the property. So, that's it. You have to get. So you get the C, you get this JC, and then you do. You can get this matrix PC, which is going to be JCP. This is not um, JC pennies, but um, so this is the projection matrix. What this is saying is, I take the original matrix, all the data. This projects it onto the subspace described by C. So I took all the dimensions that are described by C, and I get this matrix PC. Okay, and then. If I look at P minus PC and I take the Frobenius norm, 
then the claim is that this is going to be less than P minus PK, the Frobenius norm, plus epsilon. So this was as good as I could do. Okay, so why am I not looking at just C or just JC? I, I only need to do this in order to compare this, this, this matrix C to the matrix P. Um, this is putting it back in the same original coordinate system as, uh, so I can compare them as P. It's making it back to an N by D matrix. Now all the data lies on a subspace now after I've done this. It lies on this subspace defined by C. Uh, but it, it's represented along the same, and you know, um, the, the, it's represented along the same uh, end data points in these, in, these, in these D dimensions. So I wouldn't actually want to probably construct this PC. Um, I just want to use these columns and the representation there, or the, the, the subspace described by here to say, what are the important, important modes of variation? Um, yes. So since you reduced the data points to a subspace, if you did construct that PC matrix, would you have like columns that were like blank and PSD and Well, the, so what I'm doing here is I'm subtracting two matrices. So how do you subtract two? When you do the subtraction, what does this mean? It means that. I'm, I take all the elements and I subtract each element from the corresponding elements. Now, if the dimensions don't align, I can't do that. Right? So in order to compare them this way, and this is the standard way people compare them in the literature, is they, they, they take this subspace and they project it back up to the full space. So I have this n by d. And then I compare how, how different they are. And then I take all of the entries entry by entry, and this Frobenius poem says, I square all the entries, and this is like the, the mean squared error. That's what this is doing. I could divide through by, I could divide through by the number of entries, and that'd be the mean squared error, or it's the sum of squared errors. Right, so this is the sum of squared errors once I put it back to the original space. Um, so this is, and then, if you did the same thing with PK, when you're doing, the, the SVD over here, you need this, you reconstruct it with VK, SK, and UK. This UK is doing the similar thing, it's putting it back in the original space. Whereas this VK is capturing all the important direction, and SK, the, the mass along those directions. UK puts it back so you can compare it. So if you want to look at the data in the original space, you need this. If you just care about the structure of it, then you just need the directions and the magnitude. So, so this allows us to compare it to PK here, which was the best we could do. Um, and we're doing an epsilon times this one, times the Frobenius one. Yeah, so it minimizes this term right here. This PK for a k-dimensional, for a, k, a rank k matrix, so that means it lies in a k-dimensional subspace. The SVD will optimize, minimize this term. And so we're, yes. Yeah. Oh, it gives us the minimum k-dimensional uh, matrix, right? It's a minimum, in, the optimal in terms of the norm for what is normal of the matrix, right? Correct. And also the two norm, which is the maximum Yeah, okay, so, so let me do a picture just in 2D with this, right? <coughs> Let's say I have t two vectors, and, and they look like this. This is going to be C1, and this is C2. I want to make this orthogonal 
Right, so the first thing I do is this pink marker I found. So I'm, I'm going to, this vector maybe is too short. So I'll take this one and I'll make it so it's a length one. Right? Now this vector is not orthogonal to this one and it's too long. So what do I do? I, I look at the component which is not along here and I, I make it so it's orthogonal. So this is going to be, maybe this is going to be J1, and this is going to be J2. I also made this a unit vector. So now think of, it's hard to see in, in 2D, but in 3D think there was actually, they lied in this three-dimensional subspace. They could have come out of the board. But they happen to lie in this plane. And so these two vectors, J1 and J2, describe the same plane as these C1 and C2, but they don't come out of the plane. So they describe the same subspace as C1 and C2, and these are, so these are orthogonal to each other, and they're both going to be on unit vectors. So, so this could be, these two vectors could make up JC now. And then I can use it as an orthogonal projection. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, All right, so, so I, um, I just want to say a few notes about this and then move on to a uh, different technique of, of, of doing this. Um, so, um, so I, I, this, this value t here, this 1 over epsilon squared times k log k, um, is, how is this value compared to k? So it's actually not that, it's, it's a fair bit larger than k. This log k may not be that bad. Maybe if, if k is, is 10, then this might be 23 or something like that. The k, just the k log k part, right? But this 1 over epsilon squared part is, is, is trouble. Um, it's, if you want 1% error in the, um, in the Strobenius norm, so, um, a 1% error leads to epsilon equals 0 0.01, and that means 1 over epsilon squared is going to be 10,000. So this is, this is pretty big. Um, in practice, usually, you don't need quite this many samples to, to get it. This is not practical by itself. Um, so, uh, the, this is, is, is a downside of this, this technique. If you only care about fairly low resolution, say you care about 10% error, which in many cases actually is, is sufficient for this, the things below, say, 10% error in the Frobenius norm may actually be, be fairly noisy um, components anyways, is um, then epsilon equals 0 0.1, and this number comes down to just 100. Um, and in practice, it may actually actually be better than this. So you may go from from 10 to something. In the worst case, this would maybe be about um, like 2,000. But in practice, maybe with something like um, 100, this would be okay. So from a size perspective, the SVD is clearly much much better. Um, the advantage of this is that. It, um, it gives you these row, these columns, which are more easy to interpret, right? Maybe if you only cared about the top, um, like the top three or four genes, right, that you want to look at, this would maybe, you know, even if you just took these up to up to. So what? So I, I, one of my friends has helped develop some of the technology here, is that he worked with some some people in genetics and they, they want to look at some candidate genes to test for for, for something. And so they, they want the top four or five, they give them maybe a list of 30 or 40 or maybe 50 from this technique. And then they can look at them and say, these genes are not, you know, I, I, I kind of know what these do and that's not, I, can, I don't have to test those. And then look at what's remaining. And there may only be five left that are good candidates. They, they match up with something else that they think is important. And so this, 
you know, that this has been useful in some scientific endeavors. Um, but I'm, but I'm, I, I always worry about this term. When you see one over epsilon squared, you should be a little bit worried about it. Um, so the next technique we'll talk about will does not have this one over epsilon squared term, but it also doesn't have quite this nice property of interpretability. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the trade-offs. Um, so you can also um, improve on this air bound a little bit. This is on the air of, uh, of the whole um, Frobenius storm, and this might be pretty large, actually. You can get something instead where you do P minus um, 1 plus epsilon. So now, instead of an epsilon times the Frobenius group of all P, this extra epsilon is times the difference between P and PK. So it's towards, towards the left over. So this gives you a much better approximation error. Um, the, how this technique works is instead of creating the weights like this, what you do is, is, is you create the weights, let me write this here. Um, the, then the weights are created like, um, So you, you take this, this column and you project it onto the top k subspaces. So you start by computing the SVD, and then you, you take this, this, this top k subspace, which contains the air that you want, the, the part that you actually care about looking at. You think everything past here is going to be noise. So you only look at the data along these dimensions, and you, and you look at this squared as you know, and then you sample <coughs> the same way as before. And, and then you get this, this better error gun. So the one here, you can do very efficiently in, in a streaming setting. Every time you see a new item, you can sample it according to this weight. Here, you need to create the SVD first. So this one is not going to be any more efficient, but it will give you an error bound, which is better. So that's going to be the advantage here. Um, so I, I've run some, some basic experiments with this, and, and uh, and this one works better if there's a sharp, if there's if there's not a sharp drop off at the k at the k value. Um, if there is a sharp drop off, then these weights are going to be almost the same anyways, and so they're going to work similarly. And you can almost get this better air bound even um, by by doing the same thing in practice. Um, so um, okay, so. So, so this was mainly useful if you cared about the interpretability of columns, but the space blow off is, is, is not going to be that useful um, if, you, if you care about very high precision. For low precision things, you might be okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I'll defer more questions about this to, to afterwards, but the algorithm should be pretty simple. So you understand how the, how the algorithm works. Um, th there's, there's another technique, which is essentially trying to solve the same problem. And it's going to work better in the streaming data and have a smaller space time. And it's going to use a trick like, uh, like the Misha Greed's trick. And so this is um, a fairly new paper um, by Liberty. Um, in 2012, and in some comparison uh, tests, it, it performed much better than this. And it's going to have this is going to have a size of um, it's essentially going to have the number of, of columns that you need t here is going to be two over epsilon, whereas this was one over epsilon squared k log k. Now the error bounds are going to be slightly different, but if if you want 10% error here, um, you're going to need 20 columns. And if you want 1% uh, you know, error, you're going to need 200. You, you, you may not have been able to do better than, than, than uh, 
100 anyway, so maybe you're off by a factor two. So I'll, I'll, I'll describe, once I describe the algorithm, I'll describe what the error bounds, what the specific error bounds you get. Uh, but this will have much better potential for, for, for space. It's going to look maybe much closer to what this, the size of the BK is. Okay, so what's, what's the idea of the algorithm? You're going to, um, so it's going to be in a stream, and you're going to do one um, row, which is the same as one point at a time. So think of one customer. You know, you have n, n customers, and you're getting one new customer every time, and they get a bunch of attributes. Or maybe you're monitoring some something on your web page, and you're getting you get a, a log with d different things in it, and you get a new you know visit to your web page, right? So every time you get a new visit, you want to kind of keep a uh, an approximation of the subspace of, the, of all these all these visits. So, so you're tr trying to get these one at a time, and so. You should think of this, so what we're going to do is we're going to maintain some, um, some matrix Q, um, and this is going to be, um, this, this matrix is going to be um, um, T by T, where, where T is this big. And so, so with respect to the SCD, we're only going to capture the SK times the BK transpose part. We're not going to worry about mapping it back to these UK. We're not going to worry about mapping it back to the data. That would require us to have something of size um, of, of size n, where n was very large. We want the summary, and we just care about this small subspace which contains the data. We don't, and maybe how much variation there is in the data, but not, you know, every individual data record itself. Okay, so. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the first, um, we're going to, so if, we're going to start out by, um, so to initialize this, we're going to set Q equals to um, P1 um, up to PT. We're going to take the first T rows of P, and we're going to call this Q. And so the, the and and so what we're going to do is we're then going to um, take the um, the SVD of Q, and actually this U part is going to be mapping back to the space. We're not going to care about this, and we're going to set Q equal to S the transpose. If I understand correctly, so we first grab just the first column, all the rows in P, and then we are we okay, and then we just do the SVD on that on that. <laughs> so we're getting the so we're thinking game in one row at a time. So we take the first T of the rows. Oh one row at a time. Oh yes. So so P looks like this. Oh. And so before we were thinking about columns, now we're thinking about rows. Okay. Um one row at a time. And so you can kind of do the 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 um you can do the dual of this. You can do it with rows, or you can do it with columns instead of rows, but it'll give you a different, depends on, it's just like the transpose of the matrix. So you're doing it on the different subspace. So it depends what, if you want to interpret a, a linear combination of your customers or a linear combination of your attributes. And so they give you different meanings. So, so this is row P1, um, and this is P2. <coughs> And then up to here, this is going to be uh, on my initial set, my input. So this is up to t. So I've started with this. I've taken q as an input. I've taken the SVD of q. And then I just took the amount of variation in the substance. Right? So I just cared about the top t. Um, so I know this because I only have t points. They must lie in a t-dimensional subspace. Describe it. So, and I and I do this, and the s captures the amount of variation, and the d captures the subspace. So I haven't really saved any information yet, except I've lost, you know, which point corresponds to what. 
But I'm not going to care about that. I'm only going to care about these, these, these main directions. OK. So I've, I've captured these main directions. And now I'm going to um, take a new point. Um, so now I'm going to process um, PI. And so Q here, now Q is really T by T, but it's padded with a bunch of these zeros. That initial Q so, is T by T, right? Yeah, so, 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 so this initial Q is going to be uh, T by T. Uh, T by N. Uh, no, no, T. You're right, it's T by T. Yeah, so there's actually, it's actually still t by d, but it's padded with zeros. Okay, okay so now I'm going to process this point pi, and I'm going to create, um, and so I'm going to create q plus, which is going to be um, q pi. So, so now this, this matrix is going to be, um, T by um, T plus. It's, it's still T by D because there's padded by zeros. Actually, I need to, I may have messed this up in the notes, but I need to somehow. Um, what T plus 1? What is PI? What? Can we process PI with PI? So, so PI is the next. This is the next uh, customer I This is the next row in the matrix B. So I do one row at a time. So I've, I've processed up through here, and now I'm looking at, at PI. And I'm going to so add I, this to my. So really it's P sub T plus 1. It's the next. Yeah, so the first time I do it, but recursively I'm going to do this one I at a time. I'm going to maintain a Q. So think of it as you have n points in a d-dimensional space. This is another way of thinking about it. You have n points in a d-dimensional space, and you're encountering a new point. And you're going to process this and update your, 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 you're doing PCA, so the most important direction along these points. And I have a new point, and is it, if it's along a similar direction, I'm, you know, I, maybe I've captured already. Okay, so I'm going to get this, this QT. And, um, and, and then I'm going to take the, the SVD of, of Q plus, and I'm going to get out these matrices U, S, and B again, and I'm going to set Q again equal to S, B transpose. Um, okay, the problem is this, this is now essentially um, a t, um, a t plus one times t plus one. So I've increased this this dimension here, um, and I want to maintain this as a as a t by t matrix. But the SVD tells me something important. I know which of these. So I only care about these directions and the scaling, and this tells me which of the directions is least important. And in fact, that corresponds to the last singular value in S, this S, this sigma. Um, so in the end, I've got this, let me write this up higher again. I've got this S, the transpose, where, um, and this is going to be t plus 1 times t plus 1. And, and so the S is going to be diagonal. Um, of sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma t plus 1. And, and b t is going to be a t plus 1 uh, times t plus 1 um, or um, um, it's going to be um, 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 and orthonormal matrix. And these vectors will tell me the four directions. What is wrong with you? What? What happens to you? Uh, so you don't need to use U. It's capturing how you relate back to the data points, and I'm not going to store it. 
So I'm just capturing the, the main direction. So I could have, think of it as I want to capture a two-dimensional subspace for a million points. I don't care about the individual points, I care about the directions that they vary. So, so what I'm going to do, I want to get this back to a t plus one, back to a, a t by t matrix instead of a t plus one by t plus one dimension. Right, that's going to be my um, inductive invariant in this recursive process. So what I do is I'm going to subtract out the smallest singular vector from everything. In fact, what you need to do is you need to set um, sigma i is equal to, you actually need to work with the squared version of it as, so sigma i prime is going to be sigma i squared minus sigma t plus one squared. So I'm subtracting out this. And sigma t plus one was the smallest one. So what's going to happen is that s prime is they're going to be the these sigma, um, so then it's going to be sigma one prime, sigma two prime, sigma t prime zero. The last one is now going to be zero because I've subtracted this out from it, right? Um, and so then I set q equals to s prime b transpose. And now I've it's still t plus one by t plus one. Um, but the last, uh, actually this last vector doesn't matter anymore because I multiply it by zero, so it disappears. So it's, I basically now have, after I get rid of the column I don't need anymore, this is now t, um, t by t. So I've got back this t by t. And so I keep doing this one point at a time where I add in this, this new point, I create, I do the SVD, and then I, um, I, I factor out the, um, um, I, uh, I, I factor out the smallest direction of me um, after I've added in this new point, and I, I, I get this matrix left. So there's, there's been something in the literature that was popular in computer vision and branched out to other areas called the, inc the incremental SVD which was doing something kind of like this, where it, it took every new point, it, it, it took the, um, it, it looked at the subspace, and then it just kept the top um, T subspaces without subtracting out things with this step here. Um, but no one could analyze this algorithm. It tended to work pretty well in, in practice. Um, but people are worried that it would, it would drift as you, as you, as you did this, you may get biased towards the first sum subspaces, and you would tend to always subtract out to maybe the point of the new point. And people could analyze, but this one, with this extra subtraction step, we now know how to analyze this. Um, and we can show that this, this actually works, and for a certain kind of uh, comparisons against this column sampling technique, the first thing I talked about, this one uh, worked better for the same amount of space, the same amount of matrices. Um, and so the, the, the analysis of this is really cool. If you remember the Misha Gries algorithm from streaming, what you're doing with you're keeping these t these t counters. You added a new point. If it if it landed on an existing counter, then you just you just incremented the count. If you needed a t plus one counter, then you subtracted one from everything, um, and, um, and and you may have to. And you subtracted one even from the ones that, that had high counts, but either you, but this one disappeared or something else became empty, right? And this we're able to say, because you kept t was about one over epsilon um, or two over epsilon counters, every time you subtracted, you could only do the subtraction, um, you can only subtract an, an epsilon uh, uh, an epsilon fraction of the mass from any one of the counters. Because every time you did the subtraction, you just spread it out over these t counters. So the same thing is working here. Of all the directions, I'm subtracting out the same amount. And because I subtract out from t directions which are orthogonal to each other, and because these orthogonal directions are orthogonal, they're not subtracting the same thing from two, two points at once. 
right? If I, I I've I've got this property where if I have um, this 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 point here, and I and I look at the squared this the squared distance here is called the c squared, and I can look at the a squared, which is along this dimension, and the b squared here. Then remember, c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. So if I care about the squared distance here, which I can then just take a square root of n when I'm done, if I subtract from the square root of a and the square root of b, these are subtracting separate components. They're not. I, have, I can add these together independently, and this works for any orthogonal substance. This this um, Pythagorean theorem. It, it would work if I used a different subspace for C. If instead my subspace was here, but these were still orthogonal, I can still project onto these subspaces and subtract a little bit from this one and a little bit from this one. And I'm not losing anything in the square distance. So all of the directions, so for any direction I'm subtracting at most this sigma, sigma t plus one. And because I'm subtracting this from, from t different directions, I can't subtract more than epsilon times the total squared mass. So the, the final result I'm going to be able to get is that um, let's see, for, um, um, for any um, so any direction x, so x is going to be is a unit vector, and I want to look at, um, so 0 is less than, so px is, this is my original data along this direction, this is the projection of x along my original data, this is the norm of this, minus qx, which is what I get from my, my